Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, where we connect you with members of the beef industry who can help you build a more profitable operation. As you listen to each episode, be sure to set an intention for the show. What do you want to get out of it, and how do you want to use this information to make changes on your operation? If you're looking for more ranching resources outside of what's being shared on these podcast episodes, sign up for my free weekly newsletter. I'll send ranching information and podcast episodes straight to your inbox every week. In addition to that, you will also receive a free PDF with 22 ranch management tips from the gurus who have been on my show. The link to sign up for that is in the show notes. With that, let's hear from our guest today and discover how we can improve the beef industry and our own unique cattle operations. Well, good morning, Jeremy. It's great to have you back on the show. I know last time you were on, we were able to talk about kind of cross fencing and offsets and talk about getting those paddocks set up and what that looks like. But today, I know I've got spring on my mind. We've had some nice weather here in North Dakota, but that was, this is following up some very brutally cold weather. So I think I'm just ready for spring in general. So I think it's fitting that we get to talk about spring watering systems. And so even though you've been on the show before, I would like you to briefly touch about, you know, what's your role in the beef industry right now and kind of your background with watering systems. Thank you, Shay. It's great to be back on uh, the program again. Um, I'm currently a territory manager for Gallagher North America, I cover Kentucky, Tennessee, Puerto Rico. Um, I've been in this role for about 17 years. And before that, I was a, a forage specialist for a, a regional company here in mm -hmm. uh, Kentucky. Um, besides that, my wife and I do have a small grazing based operation um, here in uh, South Central Kentucky. So I stayed pretty close to the industry, um, both personally and professionally. Well, that's great. And that's, that's what I like to hear. I love seeing people who are on both sides of it. Now, before we really started this interview, we were chatting a little bit about how with how watering can be that limiting resource when it comes to rotational grazing and some of those grazing practices. Can you touch a little bit more on how to manage water in those scenarios for people who are moving paddocks fairly intensively? Sure. And there's, there's been a lot of research um, conducted about how water comes into play with grazing efficiency. And we always find that when uh, designing a rotational grazing system, that water is always the limiting factor. Um, just a, a quick key point to keep in mind, if, if somebody is practicing some type of managed grazing or intensive grazing, that we really wanna try to keep our, our water within 800 foot um, of the boundaries of each paddock. Now, granted, that will change as we get further west into more arid areas where, where forage is not as abundant as what it is in the eastern U.S. But the 800-foot rule is really the first place that we should start um, when it comes to designing those water systems. So what is um, the purpose of the 800-foot rule? Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yes. Um, and uh, the University of Kentucky has conducted a few trials uh, as well as some other universities. Um, Missouri NRCS has uh, also put a lot, of, um, a lot of time and effort into determining that 800 foot rule. What that means is that uh, there's, there's two parts to it. One part is that if cattle are within 800 foot of their water source, then the nutrients will be distributed more evenly across the paddock. Uh, and that's been proven time and time again with taking soil samples of, of cattle that are uh, allowed to graze within uh, 400, 800, 1200 foot and so forth. Uh, but we see most of those nutrients that are redeposited back into our soil um, most efficiently at that 800 foot mark. Uh, also with, um, with temporary watering or the smaller capacity waters like we commonly see with the energy free type designs, which are normally 100 gallons or less. Um, as compared to the 1000 and 2000 gallon um, open bulk tanks, uh, cattle will come up in small groups 
if they're within 800 foot or so from the water source, rather than coming up as an entire herd, um, which if, if an entire herd of cattle, whether it's 30 or, or 100 uh, in a group, if they come up at one time, then they're definitely gonna put a strain on that holding capacity. So does that make, does that make sense? Yeah, that does make sense. And I appreciate you going into detail about that and also talking about the diff, how you can use a different tank design with that. Now, so last time you were on the show, you really talked about how when you're setting up your paddocks, you know, go get that aerial footage of the pastures that you want to um, break into smaller groups and use your graph paper and figure out where you want to put your fences. But where should what where can producers start when it comes for that water placement? You know, are these temporary water? Some producers are used to very permanent structures with wells and waterers. So where can they start as far as determining what water system is going to work best for them? Um, well, from personal experience, what my wife and I did starting out is we had uh, a couple of permanent water systems in place that were the energy-free designs, such as the Mirafounts. And we, for a few years, we used a completely portable system that actually piped in uh, with flexible HDPE uh, black roll plastic pipe that would sit on top of the ground uh, that we could move around the, the farm in different locations. Uh, once we did that for a few years, then we got a, a pretty good idea of where our balance was from a grazing standpoint of where to put those permanent systems in at, at, a, at a later time. So there are many options for temporary water and the, the temporary water is exactly uh, as it sounds. It can be completely portable with uh, the proper type UV stabilized um, black pipe that's designed to sit on top of the ground and not be buried. So would you have done anything different as you were in that temporary watering setting and just learning where you wanted to put more permanent structures? You know, looking back, is there anything you and your wife would have done differently as you were in that learning stage? Oh yeah, the whole stage was a learning stage. Um, every, every single part of that is trial and error, just like using, um, just like using temporary fencing before you do permanent fencing, um, using the temporary water, um, it, it let us for one, figure out what size paddocks that we were going to need when we started with the permanent systems. Um, and also, I guess one of the, the first mistakes we made was the type of valves we were using in those temporary water troughs. Because in, in a lot of cases, if we're in smaller paddocks, we can get away with a temporary water tank that's 30 to 50 gallons um, because the whole herd's not coming up at once to drink. And we started using some float designs that um, are pretty common. They clamp on the side of the tanks. And uh, we learned real fast that those clamp on designs were not as superior as the ones that are stock proof that actually mount in the bottom of the tank with a floating uh, bob float that the, the, the cattle can't knock off or tear up. Um, another mistake that we made, we would put the water tank um, not necessarily at the edge of the paddock. We would put the water tank 30 or 40 foot from the, from the, the boundary fence and um, when the tank would get a little bit low before it refilled, the cattle could actually turn it over. Uh, so what we did was actually, a, uh, to remedy that was something that we learned at Kentucky's uh, grazing school. And that is putting those temporary tanks right at the edge of a, a single strand of poly wire. Um, so the cattle cannot get all the way around the tank to turn it over and actually just run the poly wire right at the edge of the, of the tank. Well, I appreciate you being open and honest about those beginning mistakes, because oftentimes that's how other beginning producers are going to learn is by hearing, you know, how other cattle producers have figured out systems that work for them as well. So what are some of the, you know, anytime we're looking at fencing, putting, putting in water systems, there's always an infrastructure cost. So what does that kind of look like as far as pipes and pumps and water tanks, like how can beginning producers start managing some of that cost as they're starting out? So from a, uh, from a permanent standpoint, uh, which would be the, I guess, the easiest to, to guesstimate for, uh, for this topic, um, from a permanent standpoint, 
there is going to be a lot of variance. Uh, one, depending on the type of pressurized system you have, whether it is a gravity feed system that's out of a, a bulk storage tank. Um, and we can talk more about that in a minute if you would like. Um, mm -hmm. And then um, also the amount of pipe. And that has probably been the, the largest factor of variance lately is the cost of the pipe itself for a permanent buried system. Uh, but on average, you can, you can figure um, for an, an energy-free water uh, system, for example, like a, Mar a Marifount, um, somewhere in that $700 to uh, $900 range for the tank. Um, most of most all applications should be mounted on a concrete pad. A lot of companies across the country will make a pre-poured concrete pad that's going to be in the $150 range or so. Um, and then probably three to five hundred dollars for the heavy use area around that. Um, and that's that's going to be the the I guess the most easily uh, to describe from a cost standpoint a permanent system. Yeah, I appreciate that. And obviously prices do vary and it'll depend on where you're at in the country and what that system needs to look like. So Jeremy, there are, I know there are a lot of programs out there to aid producers in some of these more regenerative practices, whatever it may be. So what do you know about any potential cost share programs that producers could look into? Well, there, there's a wide, uh, wide range of cost share opportunities that, that stretch from coast to coast in the U.S., uh, most commonly would be cost share that uh, comes as a result of the, the farm bill. And most of that is ran through the EQIP program through the NRCS. Um, I have participated in that program a few times myself. There's a, um, a great amount of assistance that comes with that from a designing and engineering standpoint using your local USDA service center. Uh, so the federal cost share through EQIP is, is one example. Also, many states have their uh, state conservation districts that will cost share to install water infrastructure. And then on the private side, there's, there's several private um, organizations that will cost share with producers. And I guess the root of all of that is trying to protect our uh, natural bodies of water, whether it's streams or lakes or ponds and, and uh, trying to keep cattle out of those sensitive areas and provide them with a, a, a fresh, clean type source of water. So many, many cost share options available from state to federal uh, to uh, privately funded organizations. Well, absolutely. And thank you for bringing that up. Um, I know it's just something that I think those programs are important for producers to look into because they do help and they do make a difference. You touched on keeping cattle out of some of those natural waterways, ponds, streams, whatever it may be. Is there anything else you want to add to that from the environmental standpoint when we talk about water systems? Uh, sure, and, and you know, I realize that there's some cases where it may take a while, um, if, it, if it ever happens, for a producer to completely eliminate um, cattle that are, that are uh, grazing along or, or drinking out of streams or lakes. So there's a, a very easy, design that, um, that we work a lot with with our, our customers at Gallagher, and that is just designing a limited access point to those streams uh, or lakes, um, with, uh, and it's easily done with electric fence. So for example, take a stream. If you fence off both sides of the stream bank where cattle can't get into the stream, you still have to allow them a place to drink. And what we typically do is we'll find a place in the stream um, and design that with a heavy use area. So a ramp that can go down into the stream area and then line both sides of the creek with some type of a water gap, whether it's a cable that runs across with electrified chains that drop down um, or, or electrified pipes that are insulated off of that cable. And then what we see is on that heavy use area made out of rock, cattle will go down to the stream, they'll drink, and they will immediately leave that watering area and go back to grazing. And the same thing can be done with a pond or a lake. Just fix a small um, limited access area with uh, use, using uh, power fencing. Well, I appreciate you going into detail about that and discussing that factor. Now, you were talking earlier how you were pretty excited about a satellite water monitoring system that will be coming out 
in late spring, correct? Is that what you said? Late spring, early summer, yes. Late spring, early summer. So can you talk about, you know, what that looks like to get that set up and what that'll mean for producers to have this technology available? Sure. And uh, I guess first, the, the identified need for that was uh, whether it's whether it's in the far reaches of uh, East Tennessee or whether it's in the arid areas of you know, California or Montana, we do have producers that are, are checking tanks daily on a daily basis. And sometimes they're, they're devoting an employee that does nothing but check water level in cattle water systems. Um, we've seen over the last few years some different designs of um, ways to remotely monitor water, uh, water levels in, in tanks. And what we have uh, finally settled on within our organization is a satellite-based water monitor system. Uh, and if you were at the, uh, the NCBA convention last week, then you may have seen that um, at our booth. Uh, but it's a satellite-based water monitor system. It doesn't require a cell phone signal. Uh, it just requires a, a view of the sky, essentially. And it will re report to an app multiple times a day. And there's many applications that we can see that used in. Um, what, something that's very common in the, the southeastern U.S. is we have, um, and these systems, again, are, are designed mostly by NRCS. But um, in the mountain areas of East Kentucky or East Tennessee, then we may have a place where we're pumping water out of a stream or a lake using a solar pump design, pumping that to the top of a ridge or a mountain and storing that water in a, in a large storage tank. It may be a, a, a one or 2,000 gallon tank. And then from there, that water is gravity fed across the property into uh, permanent water systems. And so in a case like that, where we're relying on um, water being pumped up a hill or up a mountain using solar technology, uh, there's a lot of things that could go wrong, but being able to remotely monitor those water levels uh, in those tanks on top of a mountain is, is priceless. Absolutely. I mean, I, I joke, I'm a flatlander. I live in a very flat area of North Dakota, but, um, even with us, we have pastures that's just 14 miles away and that's not far considering some of your more remote areas, but it still does take a lot of time out of the day or week to make sure and go check that water every day during the hottest times of the summer. Oh, and absolutely. So that's, and what's, it, and what's it worth to a producer, um, if you know, they have uh, 200 pairs grazing on a pasture and, and uh, a windmill breaks down overnight and those pairs hit the water tank and start to, to drain it down over a you know, half a day's period. And that's water is, is a major contributing factor to uh, feed intake. And I mean, it's, it could be the most, one of the most important uh, pieces of the puzzle uh, for cattle producers that are grazing. Absolutely. Feed intake, overall animal health, it's important. And the amount of time it could save, like you mentioned, where some producers have employees who are solely dedicated to go check waters. I mean, that saves those producers a lot of time too. And those employees can be used elsewhere to help advance the operation instead of just trying to minimize the damage or um, stay stuck on one thing all day. Right. And I think it's important too, to keep in account um, the time of the year and how those water demands increase. Um, for certain times of the year, because in the in, in the winter time when we're in that forty to fifty degree range, then uh, a thousand pound cow may only consume about ten gallons of water a day. But once we see those summertime temperatures increase into the 80, 90 range, um, then uh, we can look at you know, thirty gallons per thousand pound of of body weight, uh, which is a significant increase. So that's our summertime grazing water supply is uh, very important to, to keep a good monitor on, especially if it's a gravity fed system or a, um, a well type system and we're not relying on a municipal pressurized source. 
Absolutely. Well, Jeremy, as we kind of wrap up today, is there anything else that you want to add about the discussion of spring watering systems? Um, maintenance. Maintenance is something that we usually don't think about until it absolutely has to be done. Um, but, and this is uh, something that producers that have the energy free ball type waters or the open type water should do, and that's clean your tanks out at, at the end of winter time. I know with, with our mirror founts uh, that are in our areas where we feed hay in the winter, it's amazing the, the type of things that cattle will pack to the water trough and then deposit into them. I and we found rocks that are the, the size of your thumb in there. And of course, a lot of uh, hay and debris that get dropped in those tanks. Um, so it's, that's a, probably one of the, the priority things on my checklist every Every year, but about the time the weather starts to warm up, is to pop the drain plugs in those tanks and, and flush all of that debris out that's been sitting there for three or four months. Uh, also, a great time to uh, go around and check the tanks that you have not been using all winter. It's pretty common for producers to have cattle in, in smaller areas, uh, but go out and check those tanks in those remote areas of your property before you open the gates and start turning cattle out. Um, also a good time for maintenance on different valve systems. I mean, uh, there, there are a lot of good valve designs in the market. However, there is some maintenance involved, especially with uh, valve seats and seals. Um, Maybe a five to 10 year maintenance type item, but um, get ahead of it before you start noticing a problem and clean your tanks out, whether they're open or the, the closed style energy free tanks. All right, Jeremy. Well, thank you very much for being on the show today. I, uh, Appreciate your insight and uh, I guess helping everyone listen, get excited for spring. <laughs> yes, so in the Southeast, we are more than ready for spring, especially after the little ice event we had over here last week. So, And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day. <laughs>